it is a sign of weakness, really, that, you know, that one man could create such paranoia in the Kremlin. But I'm afraid it's all in keeping with you know, dictatorial Russian leaders. I mean, Stalin was exactly the same. Hello and welcome to Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. And today we are catching up with Michael Binion. He is a former Moscow correspondent and long-standing leader writer for The Times. He's an award-winning journalist and author of Life in Russia. Michael Binion, welcome back. Good to have you on Frontline. Thank you very much. Um, and we're talking you, with you today specifically in the light of the reported news of the death of Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader, reported dead by the Russian prison service. What's your reaction to that? Well, it's tragic, but I'm afraid it's not unexpected. I mean, he's been subjected to the most brutal regime. He was uh, in kind of punishment cells in a, what they call a special regime and then moved up to the uh, notorious prison right above the Arctic Circle, where, of course, freezing cold and presumably pretty rough conditions uh, he has himself been on hunger strike, complaining that he's been denied proper medical treatment. And uh, although he always was uh, extraordinarily jaunty and uh, still witty in the broadcasts he amazingly managed to make, it was pretty clear that he wasn't going to survive very long in such conditions. Yeah, and Michael, tributes have been flowing in. Can you just give us an idea of Navalny, who he was as a politician and as a person? Well, he was a man who absolutely refused to compromise. He was a lawyer. He started off uh, investigating corruption, which, of course, was wildly popular. Uh, and he was very savvy in using social media to post um, stories and indeed images of corruption, especially at the higher levels. And what really infuriated the Kremlin was that he managed to uh, find out information about Dmitry Medvedev, the former interim president, as it were, uh, and now Putin cheerleader, uh, and his uh, extraordinary lavish kind of country retreat and yacht and whatever. Uh, and it was very hard for them to deny it. But I think what annoyed Putin even more is that there was a story published with pictures and all sorts of evidence of a Black Sea palace at Putin's disposal, which is an extraordinarily lavish and um, opulent looking place. And these sort of things really got under the skin of the Kremlin. But I think it goes back even earlier. It goes back to the time when he was uh, demonstrating after the 2012 Putin election, presidential election, uh, which Putin came back to the Kremlin after four years as prime minister. And most Russians, many thought that this was a charade. It was a sort of fake. And Navalny was there more or less inciting huge crowds that gathered to demonstrate over this. And I think Putin felt that this was a real challenge to his authority. And from that moment on, really, Navalny was a marked man. Yeah, he, he was a man with great charisma who uh, lived and died opposing Putin and corruption in his regime. He was barred from running elections in 2018. And he'd been tolerated, though, for, for a decade, hadn't he? Um, in 2020, he was poisoned with Novichok on a fact-finding mission to Serbia. Why had time run out for him exactly? I mean, is it that moment you, you spoke of just now or, or was, it, was there a, flip, a tipping point for him where time ran out? Well, I think it was a steady erosion of his uh, possibilities of speaking out. Um, as you say, he had been campaigning for some time and because he was well known in Russia and indeed abroad, the Kremlin felt that they couldn't really uh, silence him or they couldn't just throw him in prison as indeed they did later on. Uh, so they tried to sort of limit his appeal, not much that they could do. But I think the moment that really angered Putin was when Navalny spoke out against the constitutional amendments that were passed, obviously inspired by the Kremlin, that allowed Putin to run for uh, at least two more terms, which means he would be in power for, uh, well, goodness knows how many more years, uh, making him the longest serving Russian leader since Stalin. And uh, this was denounced by Navalny and his people as basically pure charade and uh, undemocratic. And that really angered Putin. And then uh, the attempt at poisoning him with Novichok on a flight in Siberia, as you say. I mean, he was very, very lucky that the pilot made an emergency landing. Presumably, he hadn't been given instructions what to do. And that uh, Navalny was immediately offered treatment in Germany. And before they could stop him leaving, 
He flew off to Germany where he got good treatment. Uh, and then to everybody's sort of amazement and possible admiration, he decided he'd go back to Russia, uh, which immediately sealed his fate. He was arrested on arrival. Yeah, and I, I remember, I mean, anybody who saw that footage of him groaning on the plane will never forget that, that, that was filmed when he was suffering from the poisoning. Um, yeah, you say returning back uh, from Germany to Moscow sealed his fate. And then uh, only in August last year, he was sentenced to yet another 19 years in jail. He was never going to be released as long as President Putin was the president. Well, that's what he himself said. He said... Uh... Either I shall die first, or the regime will die, or Putin's regime will die. Uh, and he was absolutely right. And then, sadly, he died first. But, of course, what particularly angered Putin was that he had a very sharp and sarcastic tongue. And he was mm. absolutely uh, uh, defiant. I mean, he refused to be cowed. He would, even in prison, uh, where, amazingly, for some time, he was still allowed to make uh, videos or at least um, common, you know, broadcast uh, which he did sometimes from a court where he was uh, held, um, taken for all these various spurious charges. And the tone was always pretty defiant and very jaunty and sarcastic. And they didn't like that. And I mean, the, the real coup was when he was in Germany and he managed to track down the uh, security services people who were responsible for poisoning him by putting Novichok in his underpants, which is pretty gruesome. Uh, and they more, he more or less got them partly about trickery, they weren't quite sure who they were talking to. He got them to admit that they did it. Well, of course, that really is an absolutely humiliating thing for the regime. Mm. I mean, you mentioned that, you mentioned uh, what he uncovered about Dmitry Medvedev earlier, and also this documentary, the two-hour documentary of Putin's palace, um, which he narrated. Um, what was it about these things, these investigations, that angered President Putin so much? Well, it's the exposing the hypocrisy of the Kremlin, because Putin has always maintained that, you know, he's an upright uh, person. He doesn't have a lot of personal wealth. The Kremlin puts out absurd statements about, you know, he, he earns a normal salary, I mean, a pretty meager salary, uh, and that none of this uh, property is in his name and all that sort of thing. Um, but it's exposing the hypocrisy and exposing the kind of obvious double standards and shenanigans of these people who maintain, yes, yes, we're trying to clear Russia of corruption, but they themselves are the biggest benefactors of, of this kind of corruption. Mm. The, the, the last large-scale demonstrations took place in Russia after he had returned to his home country and been detained even from behind bars. He was able to exercise this influence for a time. Um, but public dissent has since really fizzled, hasn't it? Why? Well, that's really the clampdown uh, after the start of the Ukraine war. Yes, I mean, the public was still quite, I won't say able to speak out, but people did, you know, voice their views and they weren't always locked up and imprisoned and, you know, persecuted. But since the start of the Ukraine war, a series of measures have been passed, which gives the authorities much more uh, leeway to just clamp down on anyone speaking out labeling it as, as terrorism or treasonous or whatever it might be. Uh, and uh, in fact, at the same time, the Kremlin disbanded the loyal group of uh, Navalny's supporters who had been his sort of campaign workers and who were still tirelessly putting up uh, videos and things that he posted on uh, social media. Uh, and they were all told that this was uh, extremism and terrorism and that effectively they would be uh, arrested or imprisoned if they continued. So several of them have, have fled um, and the whole organisation has been basically uh, disbanded. So did public opinion inside Russia change towards, inside <clears throat> Russia, change toward Alexei Navalny or, or, or did it just become more muted, his, his support? I think definitely it became more muted. I mean, I'm sure some people uh, were influenced by the denunciations and the uh, labeling of him as an extremist and a terrorist and aiding the enemy, uh, supporting uh, the West's um, help to Ukraine and all that sort of thing. I mean, it, it was pretty risky of him to denounce the Ukrainian war, especially at a time when Putin made it quite clear that anyone who did so would be seen as an a enemy of the people, as it were, a treason treasonable action. Uh, and I think people may have sort of felt, well, He's gone a bit far in that. But on the corruption issue, 
a whole generation of young Russians have for a long time uh, admired and supported his work in exposing corruption because it was done quite cleverly. It was all through legal means. I mean, he got hold of documents and he found evidence and he, he didn't just um, parade various accusations. He made it quite clear that these were credible documents that showed uh, the kind of thing that um, was exposed and that deeply embarrassed um, the senior entourage in the Kremlin. And in your time covering the Soviet Union, have, have you seen anything quite like this before? Well, I mean, in Soviet times, which is when I lived in Russia, uh, the KGB were pretty all-powerful and they would clamp down on dissidents. And of course, the one that re one recalls would be Andrei Sakharov, the nuclear physicist who became virtually the only and sole dissident speaking out against uh, the corruption in the Kremlin, or Brezhnev and the party and all that. And in fact, he is a figure rather similar to Navalny. He refused to compromise. And Navalny knew or know, I mean, many Russians admire tough figures who will not be cowed. Sakharov is one example, Navalny himself, maybe even consciously taking his lead from Sakharov, refused to be cowed. And this earns a lot of respect in Russia. People have a, a kind of a, an affection for uh, principled martyrs who will not be silenced. And uh, of course, that was both Sakharov and Navalny. That was, in the end, what, what brought them down. I mean, Sakharov was lucky that uh, when he was exiled internally to Gorky, um, Gorbachev came to power and pardoned him. And it was clear that he was already wildly popular. Is it possible at all um, that you can um, predict what may come of this by looking at that event in history? Very difficult to say. I mean, clearly the pressure is on Putin. I mean, I, did, I think he did feel that unless he shut Navalny up and silenced this clear, open opposition, continuing even in prison, he would be undermined in his authority. And he knew that others might challenge him. Indeed, as they as happened, as the Prigozhin mutiny happened at uh, mm. this extraordinary event last year, uh, where the former, um, his former, you know, cook or personal assistant uh, was running the, the Wagner group of mercenaries. When he staged this mutiny, I mean, Putin had to respond. Otherwise, he clearly was, uh, was undermined in his power. And he did respond pretty viciously. And in fact, there was the so-called mysterious air crash, uh, almost certainly sabotage, in which Prigozhin was killed. And that was a clear warning. Don't you attempt to thwart me. So, so interpretations of Alexei Navalny's death, they vary from, from it being a sign of weakness that President Putin has to stamp out any potential um, dissenters or actually of growing confidence and strength. How do you see it? Well, I think Putin didn't want Navalny to die publicly in prison, as it were, because, I mean, he clearly wanted him uh, to succumb to, you know, some kind of illness, heart attack or whatever it might be. And the official finding may probably be, oh, he suffered a heart attack. In fact, I think they said it's a heart clot or something like that, mm. uh, which is very mm. convenient. You know, he had a medical condition. But, I mean, the aim was to so weaken and enfeeble him that essentially he would be hardly able to mount any kind of um, visible presence or, or opposition from prison. Uh, and it is a sign of weakness, really, that, you know, that one man could create such paranoia in the Kremlin. But I'm afraid it's all in keeping with, you know, dictatorial Russian leaders. I mean, Stalin was exactly the same. A single voice raised against him uh, meant immediate death, uh, and he would not tolerate any kind of dissent. I mean, if anything, it's surprising that he, he's managed to stay alive. He managed to stay alive so long. It is surprising. I mean, he's a pretty resilient fellow uh, and, and pretty tough uh, mentally and probably also physically. Uh, and he survived uh, some very unpleasant, harsh jail conditions. I mean, he was put in a so-called special regime, uh, which is like a punishment cell. And he was held in isolation and he was held in places where it's freezing cold, you know, and clearly he would be suffering. I mean, the sad thing is it just reminds us exactly of what happened to prisoners in Stalin's time. Mm. How do you think uh, Putin's oligarchs and other senior members of the Kremlin will respond to this? Well, they won't really say anything about Navalny's death. I mean, they will 
they will quietly reflect on it and think, yes, unwise to challenge Putin, which of course is the message he wants to send out. Um, some might have a sneaking admiration for him, but it's dangerous times in Russia. They, people keep their heads down. Whatever they think, they don't really speak out very much now. And so the oligarchs will be focusing on trying to get the economy going, which I have to say has been remarkably successful, even in light of Western sanctions, that the Russian economy is fairly robust. But um, most of those around Putin will know that they want to try to keep a lid on expressions of public dissent, particularly over the Ukraine war. Mm. Uh, John Bolton, um, he was one of those people, um, the uh, US National Security Advisor under Donald Trump, he was one of those people speaking on Times Radio who was saying that, that this is a sign of, uh, of strength from President Putin, that he feels very much in charge and he isn't worried about the consequences, that the West is weak. Um, do you agree with that? Well, I think it's certainly true that Putin feels strong enough now not to worry whatever the fallout will be. And there will be, you know, a lot of private grief and upset, but I don't think there's any expression of open regret or, you know, calls for the martyr to be recognised or any of that. Russians at the moment are too cowed. They're keeping their heads down. They may think what they think, and many do think that, you know, what's going on is, is wrong, but they don't come up with it openly now. The, the situation is pretty repressive. I don't think it shows Western weakness, because what, after all, could the West possibly do? Um, they can't bargain to have uh, Navalny released. Putin would never agree to that. He would say it's interference in his affairs. Um, the, the, the worry is the Wall Street Journal uh, correspondent who's been in prison for some time, Evan Goshkovich. Mm. Uh, and, you know, he might be kept in fairly harsh conditions. And it's quite clear that he's also being held as a sort of hostage because Putin's made it clear he wants to swap him. And I think the pressure on perhaps Biden maybe to do a deal on this, knowing what the fate of others who are being held has been. Mm. Might that be part of Putin's playbook then? Well, I don't think they're explicitly linked. I mean, Putin couldn't really decide at what point Navalny would die. Um, he clearly made conditions so intolerable that it wasn't going to be unlikely. Uh, we don't really know the circumstances. I mean, whether he just fell unconsciousness as he was going for a walk, which is the official version, or not, there will be a, a so-called inquest, although it comes to the conclusion that he suffered a, a normal heart attack, which was nothing to do with um, the conditions he was held in. He'd been treated humanely, and he just died. Well, I don't think many people will believe that, but that will be the line. OK, but uh, I mean, the announcement of his death, it's in the middle of the Munich Security Conference, the world's leading forum for debating international security policy and addressing the world's most pressing security concerns. So is that just a coincidence that might actually please President Putin? Could be. Hard to tell. I mean, it, it could simply draw attention to the repression within Russia uh, and it could embolden the Munich Security Conference to give full backing to those opposing Kremlin policies. On the other hand, if Navalny had died uh, and they had said nothing, I think news would have leaked out pretty swiftly and it would have been seen as a tacit admission that he was murdered, you know, that, that, that he was killed on, on Kremlin orders. And they, they clearly want to make clear, oh, no, no, nothing to do with us. No, he was a normal prisoner. He was being treated properly and he just had a health problem. So I think they felt if they got in quick with the announcement, it would um, it would diffuse the situation. There has been a long list of Putin critics who've been poisoned, fallen out of windows, one assassinated on the bridge. Um, <clears throat> OK, we don't know that he actively ordered the killing of uh, Navalny, but he is largely being blamed for being responsible for his death, for the condition in which he was left. What do you think actually decides President Putin in when he wants an adversary eliminated? Well, I think he doesn't want any adversary eliminated in the full glare of publicity. So the first thing was to isolate Navalny, shut him up, deny him access either to uh, social media. I mean, it's amazing that his lawyer and others were able still to broadcast his views, even while in prison. Uh, so the first thing was to remove him far away, send him up north to some uh, godforsaken prison camp above the Arctic Circle. But the other thing is that Putin knew that uh, Navalny had something of a 
big following, particularly among young Russians. And in a way, he was campaigning on an issue that Putin himself has repeatedly said is the one thing he's trying to do, which is to end corruption. Now, Putin has in mind petty officials. He doesn't have in mind the corruption of his own circle and the people around him. But Navalny, being a lawyer, was very clever in the way he framed the evidence and presented it. And I think it was felt that, you know, just, just getting rid of him just like that would have looked so obviously like a, a sort of dictatorial thing to do. And Putin is permanently and always trying to show he is the properly elected, democratically accountable uh, president and that he doesn't behave in a capricious way. Well, you can think what you like, but I mean, most people will not be fooled by that. And is there any political party or leader left in Russia right now that can mount a challenge to President Putin? Not anybody with any voice or exposure or um, following among other Russians. Not really, no. Uh, he was the last, and that's why he was pretty important. I mean, there have been people who have denounced the Ukrainian war, and they've been uh, silenced pretty quickly. I mean, the television announcer was uh, bundled off the screen and has now been prosecuted. Various others have come up with, um, you know, questioning of the, the Ukraine war and various other things. And they've effectively been removed from, from either from office or from public view. Uh, but they don't already have any kind of following. They're not people well known. Uh, and so, in a way, Navalny's credibility was what kept him uh, alive for so long. I mean, uh, the Kremlin was not going to kill somebody who clearly was seen to be um, a credible figure among much of the Russian public. Mm. If I can just turn to, to another development um, in the recent days, and there's been a story around this week uh, that Washington had new intelligence related to Russian nuclear capabilities and attempts to develop a space-based weapon. Uh, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken has said this is not an active capability, and the early analysis appears to judge this threat as not as a nuclear warhead, but rather a high-powered device requiring nuclear energy to carry out an array of attacks against satellites. What do you know about this? To be honest, I don't know very much, but I'm sure this thing will come up in the current NATO, uh, sorry, not the NATO, the Munich Security Conference, which, as you say, uh, is a gathering of many people involved in uh, intelligence and planning and uh, uh, war scenarios and things of that kind. Uh, and it's not at all surprising. I mean, I would also be surprised if the United States itself hasn't developed some kind of capability, because the need to knock out satellites is an obvious one in wartime, when the enemy is using satellites, as the Ukrainians are, using their communications, up, up you know, the links up to satellites to uh, spy on what's going on in Russia, or to obtain information, or to basically uh, find out in advance you know, what the military situation is. And that's an obvious thing. If you deny the enemy access to uh, information, usually via satellite, then you are certainly handicapping the enemy. And I think it's not at all surprising that the Russians would want to try to bring down uh, communication satellites that they feel is, um, is being, that are going to be used against them. OK, we'll watch for more developments on that matter. Um, let's return now to, to what we've been talking about mainly today, and that's the death of Alexei Navalny. And the, the prosecutor's office uh, has warned citizens against demonstrations in Moscow, saying that any specified mass event was not coordinated with the authorities and any participation would lead to arrest. Um, I suppose they would say that, wouldn't they? How crucial is it that um, what happens exactly in terms of the public response in the coming hours? Well, I have to say it would be a brave Russian who would go out on the streets to demonstrate after that. Uh, the right to demonstrate has virtually disappeared. There have been one or two people petitioning to hold a kind of silent tribute to this or that. And in very small and limited numbers, it's been sort of agreed, but effectively there's not been a demonstration at all, and certainly not against the government. I mean, there have been demonstration maybe over this or that issue that's cropped up, um, but it's very, very tightly regulated now. And any crowds that gathered in the Kremlin uh, or, well, on, on in the squares in Moscow, I mean, they would be pretty quickly dispersed. Uh, Russians at the moment, they sense the atmosphere. They're keeping their heads down. They don't want to draw attention 
Uh, they may silently feel resentful at what's going on or angry about it, but they're not in a position really to do much about it. So how do you think history will look back at this moment? I'm afraid it will simply say that this is another mark in the decline of Russian uh, civil society and of democratic freedoms in Russia, which had been introduced, I mean, quite, quite significantly uh, after the fall of communism, and which people hadn't really recognized, but a whole younger generation of Russians took that all for granted. They took it for granted. They could travel where they wanted. They could be in contact with any Western friends. They could say more or less what they wanted as though they didn't, uh, if, as long as they didn't sort of preach open subversion. And they were reasonably free within a controlled framework. Now, little by little, all that has disappeared and people are not free and they know it. And they have reacted as Russians rather sensibly would do by simply hunkering down, getting on with their jobs and uh, not really getting themselves into any risky kind of public parade of opposition. So do you think that this is the way it will be for some time to come then, given that, you, I mean, you, you talked about the, the younger generation and the, the kind of freedoms they experienced, and mm -hmm. they were, many of them, uh, the supporters of Alexei Navalny. Do you think now that their, their sort of willingness to, or their fear to actually stand up and speak now means that we, we're set on this tra trajectory now for perhaps it's a generational thing? Well, I think, yes, uh, political freedom is going to be deeply circumscribed for a long time. But I think there are other threats, uh, and those come more subtly and more, um, perhaps uh, more convincingly, from the mothers and families of those killed in Ukraine. Uh, there are a very large number of Russian casualties, and the threat of young people being called up is a very real one. And in fact, we've seen the emigration of very many young people simply in order to escape potential call-up, uh, which is a great drain and a loss to uh, Russia because they tend to be the more educated and the more sophisticated and those who can travel. Um, I think that threat uh, from the, the parents will continue. So it's in Putin's interest to continue the war, but to force the Ukrainians into some kind of truce at some point soon. OK, Michael, it's been really good to talk to you. Sorry? Sorry, I was, I was just saying goodbye. Really. Oh, Michael, okay. thank you so yeah, much. Yeah. It's Michael, it's been really interesting to talk to you. Thank you very much for your time today. Many thanks. Yes. You've been watching Frontline for Times Radio with me, Kate Chabot. You can support us now by subscribing or listen to Times Radio or go to thetimes.co.uk. My thanks to our producer today, Morgan Burdick, and to you for watching. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>